So first of all, let me thank uh, all the organizers for the good idea of organizing this uh, conference in this uh, marvelous institute. And uh, I want to dedicate uh, <coughs> my talk to the memory of uh, Edia Tush, who passed away uh, very recently. Edi was a very good friend and a very distinguished uh, mathematician. Uh, so let me move to uh, my uh, talk. And uh, well, let me start from the very, very beginning, taking what shape optimization problems are. They are uh, very natural optimization problems. The only fact is that uh, the main variable is a domain. Eh? This is why they call shape optimization. And so this creates a lot of difficulties. You cannot take the sum. Uh, this is not a vector space. So uh, there is a cost functional to be minimized. And uh, the variable omega varies in some admissible class. Eh? So, uh, well, you should certainly know the isoperimetric problem, which is one of this uh, shape optimization problem. But I will uh, be more concerned with uh, the cases coming from the PDs, uh, control problems where the governing uh, equation is a partial differential equation. <coughs> so the following theorem is. Uh, now, I think uh, quite uh, well known, uh, and this goes back uh, to the 90s, 93, and the theorem I got uh, together with Gianni Dalmaso, quite general existence or result. Because, you know, the main problem in uh, shape optimization is that uh, proving the existence of an optimal shape uh, uh, is not so common. The reason is very simple, because if you take a minimizing sequence of domains, you, you can put a 0 and 1, 1 on the domain and 0 outside. And you know very well that uh, characteristic function, when you pass to a limit, they may converge to something which is in between. And so the existence is lost. So existence is a quite uh, rare condition in shape optimization, which is not the case in the other variational problems, for instance. So uh, this is a very nice uh, existence result. And this, uh, uh, this is also very simple to state. So take uh, this uh, shape optimization problem. You fix the Lebesgue measure, uh, the upper bound of Lebesgue measure. And omega, this is rather important, is contained in a prescribed big box, bounded big box D. And you see, it's rather general. I, I want to discuss the, the two assumptions. There are two assumptions, and the conclusion is that the shape optimization problem admits a solution, an optimal domain. So let's see the assumption. The first one is uh, rather involved, gamma lower semi-continuum. I should say what gamma convergence is. Don't care about the first, because the first is always satisfied in the interesting cases. All the interest, gamma convergence is quite strong. And so all the interesting cases, you have a fu shape function, which is even more. Is, Gamma continuous, gamma continuity is very common. So forget, forget the first one. The very severe assumption is the second one, F decreasing for the set inclusion. And this is quite severe. But if you have these two, I will discuss some cases in which you have both. And in that case, the existence is guaranteed. So an optimal domain exists. So there have been, well, in which class? Uh, I, I fix only the Lebesgue measure. So 
So in general, you should expect uh, just a measurable set, but in fact, uh, uh, the existence is slightly better, slightly better. So what is a measurable set is a level set uh, of a measurable function. In fact, uh, uh, since uh, behind uh, we have a partial differential equation, the existence result is slightly better. We don't have a general measurable function. We have what is called a quasi-open set. Quasi-open set is a level set of a Sobolev function, not a major, not a general measurable function, but a Sobolev function. So optimal domains in this case are slightly better than measurable. This is a very general result. And after our theorem, several generalization improvements have been made. Let me shortly discuss. So first, removing the boundedness of the big box D and taking D equal Rn. This is not always possible, but it, uh, it has been made in a very important class of problems, what people call the spectral optimization problems, in which the shape functional is, uh, is uh, constructed by means of a spectrum of the Laplace operator. Uh, so you mix uh, eigenvalues, uh, the spectrum is discrete eigenvalues, so you mix uh, the eigenvalues in some way, and this is your uh, shape function. In this case, you can remove the assumption of the big box D. Uh, second, uh, why should we consider only the Laplace operator? People consider the, the P Laplacian, uh, not only the usual Laplacian, the P Laplacian, so nonlinear PDs. And so a uh, gamma conversion should be replaced by gamma P conversion, but the result is more or less the same. Uh, also, why should we consider only domains? Uh, potentials is also has been made. So Schrodinger, well, we are in Schrodinger Institute, or Schrodinger equation instead of uh, just domains. You put uh, the potential and you optimize the potential in that case. Also, why should we restrict it to the Euclidean case? So people consider the optimis shape optimization problem on manifolds. This also has been uh, made. And also adding some uh, extra geometrical constraints uh, on the admissible classes. So all these has, have been uh, made, but uh, on the contrary, the monotonicity assumption is very hard to remove. If you remove this assumption, you are lost. And uh, there are very simple examples. Uh, this is extremely simple. The, just the, the quadratic difference, the L2 norm between U and the given function U0, uh, you want to be as close as possible to a given uh, zero, and uh, the u is a solution of minor Laplacian equal f. In this case, existence is lost. No matter about the regularity, you can take u zero and f, is even constant. Take u zero constant, f a constant, existence is lost because in that case, uh, minimizing sequence, uh, sequences start uh, to oscillate a lot. So you see, and in this case, uh, you don't, oh, sorry. In this case, uh, uh, of course, since this is quadratic, uh, uh, you lose monotonicity, uh, clearly, because you are minimizing the L2 distance from a given target you lose uh, uh, monotony. So you can't remove uh, monotonicity at all. The monotonicity is quite uh, important. Uh, what happens if you try to remove monotonicity? Uh, what I said, uh, minimizing sequences uh, start uh, to oscillate. And finally, the, the, the limit uh, 
of a minimizing sequence is not anymore a domain in general, but it is a measure. In some sense, uh, a measure <clears throat> gives you the density of being a domain. If the density is zero and one, this is a domain. If the density is in between, this is not anymore a domain, it is a measure. So in general, the relaxed uh, version of a shape optimization problem is uh, the correct formulation is in the framework of measures. And in that case, you always get an existence, but not of a domain, but a measure. Uh, now I want to discuss some examples in which you have uh, this antagonistic behavior. So what I mean is you have uh, a functional f, uh, which is uh, good in terms of monotonicity, so decreasing. But you perturb the functional. So if epsilon is equal to zero, we are in a good framework. A good framework, uh, decreasing functional, very good. We can have, but now we perturb with the epsilon times another functional g, which is the opposite, which is increasing with respect to the set inclusion. And so you see the this, uh, the total function is not anymore a monotone in a good uh, way, so decreasing. So there is this perturbation. So <clears throat> take the one of the very famous cases where the functional f is decreasing and minimal on the ball. There are many examples for which, so Christina uh, said the several ones, the torsion, one over the torsion, or eigenvalue, there is a lot of examples in this sense. But uh, the function g, on the contrary, is the opposite. It is incre increasing and maximal on the ball. And you want to minimize this sum. Let me recall some very quite famous examples in the literature. The first one is what people call the Gamow model for electrically charged drops. Uh, so you have a drop. If the drop is not charged, only the surface tension acts on the drop. And so you, uh, you, you fall into the isoperimetric inequality. Uh. The, the surface tension is the perimeter of the drop. You fix the mass of the drop, you minimize the surface tension, so you minimize the perimeter with given measure, and you end up with a ball. But uh, as soon as you charge the drop, uh, you insert some, some current on the drop, you give electrical charge, not only the surface tension acts, but there is uh, the potential, the electrical potential. And so the gamma of uh, problem is the following. Uh, you minimize the perimeter, and this is a surface tension, plus uh, epsilon, epsilon is the electric charge, times uh, this quantity. You see this is the re repulsion between uh, positively charged particles. And clearly, this is a Coulomb law. This is a Coulomb law. Uh, X and Y are repulsed by this uh, Coulomb law, and you integrate on omega times omega. And uh, let us fix the measure, the, the volume of the drop is fixed, omega equal Y. And so here, so there is a competition, antagonist, the two terms are antagonistic, because on the one side, the surface tension tries to keep the drop together, because the surface extension would like to have a ball. On the other hand, the electrical potential tries to put particles away each other because uh, particles are charged with the same sign, so the, electro, the Coulomb law tries to, to get particles very far each other. And so this is uh, the antagonistic behavior. What happens in this case? 
So the first proof uh, is by uh, Knupov and Muratov. Uh, the first proof was in dimension two, 2014, in CPAM. And they proved uh, that, uh, uh, well, what do you expect? Oh, it is easy to expect that when epsilon goes to zero, minimizing sequences go to the ball. This is very easy to prove, very easy. The limit is the ball when epsilon goes to zero. But here the result is much more subtle. What Knupfer and Muratov proved is that below a certain threshold, epsilon zero, not only optimal domains are close to the ball, 10 to the ball, but optimal domains are the ball, are exactly the ball. So below a certain threshold, epsilon zero, the unique minimizer is a ball. And then uh, uh, the rest of the theorem is less precise. They can prove that there is another threshold, epsilon two, above this threshold, no minimizers exist, and another threshold, epsilon one, and uh, below epsilon one, there exists a minimizer, and nobody knows what the minimizer is. It could be, they say, it could be that the three, the three, three shoals coincide, and in that, this is not uh, known, but uh, if it is, this is the case, you have no existence at all, or existence of a ball. This could be the case. So the first proof, as I said, was in dimension two. Uh, after a while, they, the same authors were able to, to go up to dimension seven by using a regularity theorem for minimal surfaces. And then a set of people intervene, Igali and other Fusco, Maggi, Mio, Morini, and they proved the theorem by another, uh, by another approach without a regularity of minimal surface in any dimension, fractional perimeter, uh, PQRS. Uh, <laughs> so now the theorem is rather complete and the result is the same. Threshold below which optimal domain is a ball. And then this ambiguity no minimizers at all, or minimizers that are not ball. But the most important is this one. For small epsilon, optimal domains are exactly the ball. So this is the first example in which this antagonistic uh, behavior is, is solved. Uh, let me say another case <laughs> coming from uh, uh, optimal transportation. This is a, an interesting model uh, we developed together with Guillaume Carlier and Maxime Laborde. Uh, so uh, we started uh, by a model of uh, locating uh, parking areas around the city. The same model occurs in some biological membranes. Uh, in, this, uh, in this model, we ended up, I could describe, but you can imagine you have a city where cars cannot enter, forbidden to cars, and you have to design a parking area around the city. And uh, the two sets have to be disjoint. And what is the goal? So people go, uh, on the parking area, they park the car, and then they walk to the city. So you see very easily that an optimal transportation is inside the model, because people have to walk to reach the target in the city. So the question is, how should we design a city, and how should we design the parking area around? And so we ended up with this model, where there is a perimeter, uh, so the the border of the city should be not very complicated because you pay the perimeter. And then 
the transportation code is a vast time distance between the parking area and the city because people have to walk. If you put the parking area too far, they should walk a lot. Huh? This is not good. And so there is this, again, this uh, competition, this antagonistic behavior, because on the one side, perimeter tries to keep uh, the city uh, very compact, uh, very close to a ball. And on the other hand, the Wasserstein distance tries to spread, would like to spread the city very far, because if you spread the city in many pieces, it is very easy for people to reach the target inside. They park very close. Imagine the city, uh, you split the, the city in hundreds of small uh, quarters. So people park around, uh, they reach the, the place where they want to go very easily. So again, we have this uh, competitive behavior between uh, perimeter and Wasserstein distance. Uh, so Wasserstein, you can put uh, your favorite P, Wasserstein P. Uh, of course, the problem depends on P, but not so much. You can also put some alpha, power alpha. But the important fact is that the two sets are disjoint. Omega is the city and E is the parking area. And we fix both of them uh, equal to one. Ensure equal one to these joint sets. So what happens in this case? This is a picture. So the white part is a city, a rectangular, and the black is uh, the parking area. Uh, so this is a numerical plot of what happens. This is a oh, what, oh this is another. So this. Uh, this is a bit more complicated. A city is a Pac-Man shape. In this case, the city is fixed. We fix the shape of a city. Just the black region is unknown. And this is a numerical plot of uh, the black part is a parking area. This is a very complicated city. The, the white part. Uh, the seat again, the black part is the parking area. You see that uh, as soon as a seat is split in many parts, parking is much easier because you, you can be very close to your target. But in all these examples, the seat is fixed. Now we want to design a city and parking area at the same time. So, uh, we raised with Guillaume and Maxime, we raised the conjecture that the best city if epsilon is small, because I remember this is a, a function that we want to minimize. So we conjecture it, if epsilon is small enough, the perimeter will be dominant and uh, the optimal city should be circular. This was our conjecture. Again, it is very easy to show that when epsilon goes to zero, optimal domains uh, tend to the ball. This is easy. Tend. That is omega epsilon, omega epsilon, tend to a ball. This is very easy. Our conjecture was not only tend, but uh, when epsilon is small, is exactly the ball. But we were unable to prove this. We proved something, uh, you know, properties of optimal set, regularity, and so on. But finally, Kando Till and Michael Goldman arrived, and uh, they were able to prove this result. This is exa exactly our problem. X uh, measure, uh, they prove that for every P, P is the Wasserstein P, huh? and every alpha, alpha was the power of Wasserstein term. Huh? For every P and alpha, for every epsilon, there are, this time uh, minimizers exist always. 
And again, if uh, epsilon is small enough, again, there is a threshold epsilon zero below which uh, uh, optimal sets uh, are exactly the ball, not only close to the ball, which is easy to show, but they are ball. Okay, this is very similar to the previous uh, theorem, except that in this case, uh, optimal sets uh, exist uh, uh, always. Uh, we do not know what happens when when epsilon is big, when epsilon is big, an optimal set exists. A good question could be, are optimal sets connected for, for epsilon big? I mean, uh, we do not know. We tried some arguments, but uh, we failed. Huh? This is a good question. Okay, and then what happens when epsilon goes to plus infinity again? Optimal sets exist always, and not clear what, what is the behavior. Now I want to discuss another case. So Christina uh, already explained what lambda and t are. So lambda for me is the first eigenvalue, lambda one, say. First eigenvalue of Laplace operator with the Clay boundary condition. And T is the torsion, the torsion that Christina introduced. So again, there is a, an antagonistic uh, behavior because the lambda is minimal on the ball. Uh, this is a faber cran inequality. So let, let me fix uh, the measure of omega, the measure of omega, let's say, equal to 1. Otherwise, you can rescale. Let us fix a measure of omega equal to 1. Uh, the antagonistic behavior, uh, lambda is minimal on the ball, is faber cran and the torsion is maximal on the ball, and this is Saint-Venant. And so uh, you see here there is a product, and you don't know what happens. There is this antagonistic behavior again. So this is a defin let me skip the definition because I take advantage of uh, Christina lecture, torsion and eigenvalue. Now you should know what they are. So uh, in this case, both problems, the minimum and maximum, are interesting. So what do we expect? Let Let's look again to this quantity. Again, uh, it is easy to show when Q, the exponent, goes to zero, clearly the effect of the torsion disappears because uh, this 10 to one, only the, the dominant uh, quantity is the lambda. And lambda is minimum on the ball. So it is easy to show that when Q goes to zero, optimal domains tend to a ball. Again, when Q tends to plus infinity, on the other hand, the effect of the lambda is negligible, and the torsion is maximal on the ball for some Venant principle. So we expect, we, expect, we can prove again, when Q tends to plus infinity, maximal domains tend to the ball. This is very easy to show. So let us call small m Q the infimum of the quantity and capital M Q the supremum. And now we want to study what happens to these two numbers, small mq and capital MQ. So there are uh, questions, expression of a uh, relaxed, how can uh, we describe this uh, shape function when omega is a measure? Because we know that the relaxed version is in terms of measures. And uh, then existence or non-existence of solutions both for the minimum problem and the maximum problem. Both are interesting. 
and uh, discuss uh, if uh, this is the case. Huh? Solution is a ball or not in some of the cases. So this is the plan. So as I said, this is very natural to expect, not difficult to prove. The limit minimizers for small Q tend to a ball, maximizers for big Q tend to a ball. This is easy. And uh, if instead of a domain you put a measure, this is a, oh sorry, this is the good definition. So lambda mu is the analogous of uh, the usual lambda, except that now you have a kind of Robin problem huh? with the mu as a, the, the beta, the, the beta function of Christina now is, can be a measure. Huh? And similarly for the torsion. So instead of uh, the usual Poisson equation, you have a Schrodinger equation by a potential. And the potential is the measure now. Huh? So very similar equation, except that now you have a potential Schrodinger equation. So this is a relaxed formulation. Let me start by minimization problem. Minimization problem is fully clear now. Fully, not simple, but fully clear. What happens to the small m, small m q? Okay. So there is a threshold, and this, this uh, threshold is fully characterized. And the threshold is this one. Q, uh, two over d plus two, this is the dimension. Dimension two is one half. So if a Q is strictly above one half in dimension two or two over d plus two in any dimension, minimizers do not exist. Not in terms of domains, uh, nor in, uh, in uh, uh, terms of uh, measures no existence at all. In fact, the infimum is zero. This is rather easy to construct, minimizing sequence is th such that the infimum goes to zero. So on the other hand, if you are below or equal to this threshold, the only minimizers are the balls. So again, you see there is, and in this case, the threshold is fully precisely characterized, two over d plus two. If you are below or even equal to this threshold, there is this uh, kohler jobin theorem, uh, 1978. kohler jobin is a single person, Marie-Thérèse kohler jobin And then Brasco did for the Pilaplacian again. So there is a precise threshold below which Minimizers are exact, not only close to a ball, but exactly the ball. So now the situation is very clear. This is small mq is zero above the threshold, and it is the value explicit, you can compute explicit the value of the function on the ball below the threshold. Fully clear for the minimizers. Now, let us pass to the maximizer, to the capital M, Q. What happens to the maximizers? Uh, again, there is an easy case. If Q is strictly below one, no maximizers exist, neither in terms of domain nor in terms of measures. Nothing to do. And in fact, you can prove that the capital MQ is plus infinity. This is easy. You can construct uh, examples of domains uh, in which the function is very big, tends to plus infinity. If Q is strictly bigger than one. The first interesting case is Q equal one. Q equal one, the MQ is not plus infinity. You can compute the MQ is exactly equal to one. The supremum is equal to one, but again, minimizers do not exist, neither in terms of domain nor in terms of relaxed measures. Nothing to do, but uh, the supremum is finite. 
And uh, this, uh, this proof uh, was uh, in a paper 2016 by Michael Vandenberg, Enzo Ferrone, Carlo Nietzsche, and Christine Atrobeck. So uh, I can tell you uh, what is uh, more or less the proof. Uh, you should make a fine computation, but this main idea is I can describe. So no maximizer exists, uh, and the supremum is equal, exactly equal to one, by doing the following. This is a maximizing uh, sequence. You should take, uh, for instance, a disk in dimension two or a ball in higher dimension. You should do fine perforations, but you should be very careful about the size of the holes, the radius of the hole, and the distance between the holes. So if you call epsilon the distance between two closed uh, holes, the radius should be tuned very carefully. In dimension two is expon exponential minus one over epsilon square, and in a higher dimension, epsilon to dimension over d minus two. This is due to capacitary reasons. If you tune very carefully radius and distance, you can prove that the distance, the, the M, capital M1 is equal to one. But no maximizers exist. So uh, what happens if Q is strictly bigger than one? This is the main goal of uh, the few minutes I have. So uh, this is what we proved together with uh, Luca Briani and Serena Guarino. Uh, so first uh, uh, theorem, for every Q strictly bigger than one, so we say that uh, up to one, no hope. Either plus infinity or equal to one by strange sequences. But as soon as Q is strictly bigger than one, we are sure that at least a capacitary measure exists, an optimal measure. We do not know if this measure is a domain. Maybe they are domains, but we can't prove. But at least uh, a capacitary measure exists. Well, the proof is obtained through concentration compactness uh, principle, but now, let me skip. So you know, in, in compact, in, a, in this uh, uh, concentration compact, uh, uh, there are three possibilities for a maximizing sequence. The vanishing, and we are able to exclude by rather simple argument. So no vanishing occurs. The second uh, possibility is dichotomy. So maximizing sequences split in two parts, uh, and also we can exclude uh, this uh, dichotomy. And so finally, only compactness remains, uh, and then this leads uh, to existence of an optimal measure. Unfortunately, measure, we do not know if this measure is a domain. But now, so this happens for every Q strictly bigger than one, of course. But now, what happens if we increase a little bit uh, this number Q? And we can prove that there is, exists a threshold, a Q0, slightly bigger than one, such that uh, above uh, this uh, Q0, these uh, strange measures are domains we can prove that they are domains. Uh, we do not know the shape, it could be complicated, but they are not measures, they are domains. And this is obtained by a kind of a shape derivative, let me say. How uh, we perform a certain shape derivative, and shape derivative leads to say that uh, this optimal measure is either zero or one. And so it is a domain. But this happens above a certain Q0. It could be that Q0 is equal to one. We do not know. Okay. 
And, uh, well, let me skip the, this proof by shape derivative. Uh, what happens if Q is even much larger than this Q0? So as I said, when Q tends to plus infinity, we expect, uh, we can prove actually, that domains are close to a ball. Okay? And so uh, we prove the following. There exists another threshold, Q1, bigger than, maybe equal, we do not know, bigger than Q0, uh, such that uh, balls uh, are optimal we could not prove that they are optimal among all domains, but uh, they are optimal in the class of nearly spherical domains, domains which are close to a ball. So in the class of nearly spherical domains, if Q is large enough, balls are optimal. Okay? So the question is, what happens for the other domains? And now you could say, well, but uh, now we know that for Q large, optimal domains are close to the ball. Among domains that are close to the ball, balls are optimal, so uh, we finished, okay? Not very, this is a rather naive uh, approach because I, I was tricky, I say, I use the word uh, close in two different uh, meanings. So it is true that when a Q is large, optimal domains are close to a ball. This is true. And among domains which are close to a ball, nearly spherical, the ball is optimal. This is true. The problem is that the two meaning of close are slightly different. In the first case, close to a ball means uh, in a rather weak sense. In the second case, nearly spherical means C2. We need, in the proof, we need C2 because we perform the second derivative, essentially. We prove that the second derivative is negative. And so, uh, and so you see from the one side, we know that optimal sets are close to a ball in some reasonable sense, but even uniformly. And in the second, we need C2, C2 close. So the loop uh, is not, uh, is not closed. <laughs> and uh, let me finish. Fortunately, very recently, in a very recent paper of, of uh, two, three months ago, uh, Bukur, Lambolet, Nahon, and Prunier, they proved uh, finally that uh, uh, actually the ball is optimal among all domains. And what uh, they did, uh, they were able to show a C2 regularity. As soon as you, you show a C2 regularity, then you close the loop. Because the gap was exactly that one. We can prove that optimal domains are close to the ball. And if you know C2 regularity, everything works well. And they proved the uh, C2 regularity. And so finally, what we call the reverse kohler joban inequality is now fully achieved. The only question remains about the, the exponent Q0. In the original, uh, Kohler Joban, the threshold was uh, uh, 2 over d plus 2, fully precisely characterized. In this case, we do not know. We know now, uh, thanks to this um, result, we know that uh, there exists a threshold such that above the threshold, the maximum is the ball. So this is why you call it reverse Kohler Joban. The Q0, the Q1, the Q1 is not known. And uh, I can stop here. Thank you very much.